Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death. But they thought that he was simply referring to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. While Mary stayed at home, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and there was a stone lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has already been in there for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. And I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Westminster has been a part of my life for almost 30 years. Uh, the very first board meeting of Friendship House uh, happened here at Westminster, and I was invited in here by Chuck Delormier and Carl Mazza and Carol Weeks, who probably some of you still remember, was the president. And of course, 
Chuck and Carl being who they were, they had not told anyone on the board that they had just offered a job to some stranger, and Carol was about ready to kill him. But, <laughs> but it was a good beginning. And 30 years later, it's hard to imagine that uh, so much has happened and that this has played such a significant part in my life. Uh, and I want to begin by just saying thank you. You know, thank you for giving me a home when I was homeless, and, and thank you for being such a sustaining part of Friendship House and the service that this church has rendered, both as individuals and as a community. You know, Lent's a time that we keep going back to. It's like every season we go through Lent in preparation to Easter. Lent is that time where God keeps saying to us, you don't have it yet. There is still something to learn. There is still a barrier in your heart to getting where you need to go to be totally united with me, to let it go, to be a true Easter person. And so every season of Lent, we hear the same stories. We hear Abraham at 75 invited to take this great leap of faith and leave everything that he knew and go to a new land. We have the story last week of a man born blind who challenged back and forth by all kind of people about his faith, finally says, look, whether this man is a sinner or not, I don't know. All I know is I was blind and now I see. And this Sunday, right before the great Holy Week, we have the story of Lazarus, one that you probably know by heart, and yet we're being told, no, you don't. There is something more to learn. The scripture hasn't changed, but we have. We are different people from those who sat here in these pews last year and listened to these words. I think for me, the thing that touches me most this year is the need for death in order to go on to life. And I know that sounds a little blasphemous because most people spend their entire life trying to avoid death or even any sense of dying in our life, we deny death, and we will do anything for self-preservation. And I think this reading is telling us the exact opposite. Our faith is not an insurance policy, you know? We don't come to church on Sunday, we don't get baptized, we don't pay our tithes so bad things don't happen to us. They do. The day after 9-11, uh, Dick and Joanne Stewart lost their son, Richie, in the World Trade Tower. And I remember sitting with Joanne, who was just devastated. This was her only son. And Richie was single, he was gay, and in many ways, he was, his mom is all, was always going to be the most significant woman in his life. You know, and he called her every morning 
At 8.30 that morning, he had called her the way he always did when he got to work and hung up. And an hour later, when Joanne was in the shower, he called back and he talked to his dad and he said, Dad, something's happened. The building's full of smoke. Tell Mom I love her. And that was it. Never another word. Never a body. Never even ashes. And I remember trying to talk to Joanne that night. And Joanne had worked with Friendship House and she knew so many other people who had experienced violent deaths, who experienced tremendous losses. And without denying her pain, I did kind of feel obligated to say, there are people that live in Wilmington who experience 9-11 every day. Mothers who send their children out that door and do not know if they're not supposed to come, if they're going to come back alive. And Joanne, who I loved, looked at me and very honestly said, yes, but it's not supposed to happen to us. And I feel like we do feel that. I've been doing this 52 years, mostly walking with people who have died, who a part of their life has died. And some it's been natural, some it's like, you know, they got diagnosed with cancer, or they lost a loved one, or they're just going through a hard time, or they're handicapped and disabled. You know, the good, the good poor, the deserving homeless, but most of the people that I've worked with have gone through a season of their life where there has been a violent death, sometimes self-inflicted. They've been fired, they've been evicted, they've gone to jail, they've been arrested, their marriage has imploded, and they find themselves abandoned. The things that are not supposed to happen to us. Except that, is there anybody in this church this morning who doesn't know someone in your own family, in your own community, who is going through just that kind of death? People are working scared. Nobody feels their job is safe anymore. I'm sure there are people here who have known the devastation of being let go from a job. A job that was not just a job, but their career. Being told that what they had done for the last 15 years was no longer of value for their company. Believe me, to get up on a Monday morning when you've always gone to work and there is no place to go is a death. You cannot imagine what it is to be evicted. A lot of people in Newcastle County since 2007 have lost their homes. Maybe they've gone from a house to an apartment but I work every week with people living in camps along Limestone Road who five years ago were in Murray Trailer Park or in Limestone Terrace apartment and they lost it. And it is so devastating that they cannot pick up the pieces. There are more people living under tarps and in tents in Newcastle County than in homeless shelters. And they didn't grow up in East Wilmington. They grew up in Fairfax. They grew up in Tallyville. They grew up in Arundel. 
or along Kirkwood Highway. There was a time if you were a heroin addict, you were, you were at the end of a line. You were sleeping in abandoned houses on Skid Row. You had tracks up and down your arm and there was nowhere else to go. I was going to walk with you in a very short time until you died. Today, heroin addicts are 20 year olds. Beautiful young men and women who if they were sitting in these pews, you would think, oh great, she finally got her grandson to come to church. The vast majority of the people who live at Daughtry and Burton House, who live in our houses for, for women over on Union Street, have never lived in a city. They've never ridden a bus. They're middle-class kids who started, you know, as medicine cabinet addicts, dealing the Vicodin and the Percocets that just about everybody has in their medicine cabinet now. Leftover prescriptions from some dentist appointment. Heroin is $2 a bag. It's cheaper than cigarettes. Eleven young children, and that's what they are, they're children, die every single month in Newcastle County. Those violent deaths that used to be somebody else's story are now ours. And so we are in a different place. We who felt safe by our faith, you know, you know, faith safe that this could not happen to me and mine. Death is very, very real. And God will not keep you from that death. In our freedom, we will make choices. And people will pay the price. Not just we ourselves, but our families, our children, the people who die in the car accident because I was working on my fifth DUI, the man who was texting on a Texas highway and so runs into a church bus and kills 13 people. Death does happen. And the story of Lazarus, the story of resurrection, is not that walking with God means there will be no death. The story of resurrection is that it is only through death that we come to new life. If you look back on your life, there have been many seasons, and there have been many deaths. And if you do not die to one season of your life, you do not grow into new life. You do not become someone else. You may have had a wonderful childhood or a terrible childhood, but at some point you have to let that relationship with your parents, you have to let your time of childhood die and go on. And I'm sure some people in this room have parents and in-laws who still want them to be childs. Even though now I'm bald or now I'm gray, it's the... So long as you come to my house, you're still my child. And they cannot let go of that. There are people who have suffered deaths. Marriages that have died. Seasons of productivity that have passed away. Illness. Everything that we have is a gift. It is death that teaches us that one truth. 
When you are standing with a dying person, you are on sacred ground. And I'm on sacred ground every day because pretty much most of the people that I walk with are in a time of dying in their life. And that season, that sacred ground teaches you certain truths. And one truth is, it ain't mine. Whatever you think of that is mine, that I can hold on to, my youth, my health, my talents, my family, it is not yours. It is God's. It came as a gift to be used for a season, and it all goes back. If I can tell you one thing for sure, it is we are all going to die poor. You know, it could be a solid gold casket, but we are not taking it with us. Everything that we receive, we need to hold in open hands to be used for God's purpose. And when God says, let it go, we need to let it go. And we cannot do that. Even if our head tells us that's a good thing, we are fighters. We are going to hold on to the now as long as we can. And so we have to die. And so God has to end things. And sometimes very violently so that something new can begin. To believe in Christ, to say I'm a companion of Jesus, is to choose to walk that path and to believe that with every death, what will be given, what we will become, is greater than what we have lost. You don't know faith until you're dying. You don't know faith until something has been taken away. I have been blessed to walk with people of incredible faith most of my life. I always find it ironic that so many of my church volunteers ask me, well, you know, are they saved? You know, uh, do they have a church home? You know, how much Bible reading do you do with the folks you walk with? If they didn't have faith, they'd jump off a bridge. These are people who walk on water. These are people who have lost everything. And all they have all they cling to with all their might is the belief that they are God's beloved child and that he offers them new life. The men and women who have lost their families, the people who have lost jobs, the people who have lost health, come to Friendship House, come to Burton House, come to Daughtry House, not just to save money, not just to get another job, find a new girlfriend, you know, not just to relive the old story. They come to find a new life. They come for resurrection. And those that deny their death never make it. It is the people that realize that they are on a new path. No matter what season of your life you're in, this is real. This is real. Your life can change tomorrow. I can think of two stories that I could tell you from my own life. The first is, 
You know, I was for 23 years a Roman Catholic priest and a Jesuit. I was telling people at age five I was going to be a priest. You know, it was all, actually, I was telling them I was going to be the Pope, but <laughs> <laughs> even then I had a healthy dose of little man's disease, you know. Uh, but I always, that was what I always wanted to be. And at 18, I left home to become a Jesuit, and I loved it. I loved what I did. I loved what I served. And, and I loved the way I could use all my strength and, and do so much for the people that God put in my life. And at 35, if you had said, if there is an X in the world where you're supposed to be standing, I would have said, I am right on that X. Lessons learned. Just let me live out my life. And God, who knew me better than I knew myself, God, who colors outside the lines, no matter what the church tells you, God, who is sovereign, wove this little Anabaptist woman into my life. And I suddenly realized that as much as I did, I wasn't. I was a doer. I, I, I wasn't whole. And she filled that void. And before she came, I didn't even know the void was there. I was in denial of my loneliness. I was a workaholic. And choosing her meant letting go of everything that I was. It was letting it die. It went on for seven years. And finally, coming to a place where I sat down and I said, I know I'm called to be a servant, and I know I'm called to marry this woman. So I'm going to ask her to marry me, and you do what you need to do. And they did. <laughs> I might as well have been working at MBNA. The next thing I knew, there was a paper in front of me, I signed the paper, I was escorted to the door, I was told I could not go back to my parish to tell them why I made the decision I made, and I walked out that door like I had been run over by a Mack truck. I had celebrated the Eucharist that morning. I had been a priest at eight, and now it was done. It was done. I had no idea what the future held. I had no plan. I had to die. And it was in that absolute poverty, that absolute surrender to God of everything that I thought I was and I thought I knew, that act of absolute trust in him that Easter had could happen. And believe me, I wept at the tomb. I didn't think I had made a mistake, but I felt the incredible loss of everything that I was, that I had been, that I expected to be. And walking down the street was a, a little guy McDonald's uniform, Down syndrome, and he said, hi. I think any other day I would have been a, you know, good Catholic priest would have said, hello, and kept on going because I would have had somewhere to go. But there was nowhere to go that day. I was utterly helpless. I was utterly empty. And I said, how you doing? And he said, I'm great. He said, I just got my first paycheck. And he had two big quarts of beer, and he had a big sub, not a McDonald's. He had a sub, and he had a whole bag of movies. And he said, I'm going home, and I'm going to drink my beer and eat my sub and watch my movies. And I was so happy for him. 
in dying, there was just, I could just, just, I was filled with so much to wait for him. And how God had blessed him. And he walked away, and I was fine. It was like Easter had come. It's like, what, are, what do you fear? I have given you the love of your life. I have always been there for you. You are surrounded by people that love you. Just trust me, and there will be a way. And a year later, I was sitting here having someone offer me a job at Friendship House. <laughs> didn't look like it looked now. I didn't have any money, but God gave me back my ministry. I, who thought I would never stand in a sanctuary again, I would never preach a sermon again, am here talking to you, sharing my faith. Easter comes. It only comes after death. And sometimes a very painful death. Sometimes a death on a cross. It comes on days when we are empty. On days when we've got nothing left but our faith in God. Do not be afraid of those days. They're good days. They're birth days. And what is before us is always better than what we are leaving behind. Amen.